This episode of the Oh No 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 podcast is sponsored by Dynamic Industrial Services, the rope access specialists. As long-time Wraith Rover supporters, we are very familiar with ropey performances. But if you need a service that's more Sam Stanton than Willie Accio, look no further than DIS. Operating across Scotland, they specialise in working at height, offering maintenance, inspection, repairs and more. So if you've got any problems at a height that even John Fredrickson can't reach, visit dynamicindustrialservices.co.uk to find out more. Adam King, Dennis Prichinenko, Josh Watt, Eamon Fullerton, Willie Accio, Paul Hilland, Dennis McLaughlin, Greg Cameron, Sean Mackey, Jamie Barjonas, Timmy Abraham. The list of January low knees into Starks Park is as long as it is terrifying. No pressure, Kyle Turner. Welcome back to Oh No No No, the Wraith Rovers podcast. The January window is upon us and we've already got loads to chew over uh, as well as the upcoming visit of Starks, uh, or sorry, of Queen's Park to Starks Park on Saturday. Uh, so my name is Duncan Cameron and I'm joined by a full house this evening. So we have uh, Christina Beattie first of all. How are you Christina? Hello, I'm good thanks. Excellent. Uh, John Greer is here. How are you John? I'm good, thank you. Excellent. Blair Hopcroft is here. How are you mate? Very well mate, thank you. Excellent. I've got Robbie Weir too. How are you, Robbie? Yeah, excellent. Fantastic. And finally, Ian Lato is here too. How are you, mate? I am doped up on cold and flu tablets and I'm going to try my best not to cough and splutter my way through this episode. Excellent. Right in everybody's lug holes. That's just what we have. <laughs> um, right then, let's uh, let's start with the January stuff then and we'll, uh, we'll get on to the game after that. So... Uh, a busy week. I think a busier week than uh, than anyone was expecting, really, at this point. Um, but the the big news <laughs> to begin with, anyway, was that Dan O'Reilly uh, has decided to uh, seek new pastures. He's off to join Partick Thistle. Uh, Robbie, were you surprised by that news? Um, slightly surprised. I mean, he said that he wanted to stay, and then he decided, oh, well, I'm going to just stick at the other end of the M8. So I think short term it's not ideal given the the defensive worries that we've got at the moment with injuries. But at the same time, with Keith Watson coming back longer term, we had a really solid defensive record when Keith Watson was in the team at the start of the season. Then even over the last month, we've dipped a bit in terms of defensive standards. So you don't want to come across as sour grapes because he was a good player, solid for the level. But longer term, if we're moving forward, I think the board shouldn't have been held to ransom by it. If he's gone in and made daft demands about wages, which, again, that's between him and the board, and they're the only ones that know how much he was offered and the length of contract and things like that, then we need to do what's right for the club. So I fully back the decision that's been made and... There are going to be alternatives out there. It's just a question of who we get in and uh, our current circumstances. Again, I think we'll miss him for Saturday's game. An aerial Queen's Park um, will come on to them. But yeah, he offered a threat at set pieces. But he wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination. No player at less level is. So yeah, I'm comfortable with it. Um, Not going to get too upset. All right. Blair, how did you feel about this one? Um, as the as the news came through, yeah, I'd kind of echo that. I was a wee bit disappointed. Um, I, I kind of openly said I really liked him. Um, he's exactly the kind of defender I like. Um, kind of blood and thunder and no nonsense. And do you know what I mean? He's prepared to knock his goalkeeper out in training to get picked on a Saturday. So I kind of like that about him. That kind of 
that hardiness about him. And he definitely offered us something attacking that none of the other centre halves have. You and Murray should, but but just hasn't. Um but I mean he was signed short term, he was signed as cover. He's been here short term and he covered. Um he scored two goals against them in a a two one win. So yeah, thanks very much and, and move along. Can't blame the guy. I mean they've offered him eighteen months, so do you mean you, you <laughs> this this day and age I mean, if you've got a job offer that's that's to the end of the season, and you've got another one that's eighteen months, you're you're going to have to be pretty off your head to to take the short term deal when when the offer's there for a longer term contract. So, now nah, fair play to the guy. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I found that an interesting one. You've seen little bits and pieces, social media stuff. A couple of people saying like, um, you know, were the was there like complacency there? Like, you know, were people sitting on their hands? Did we not get an offer in front of them early enough? I can't see any any sense in that at all. Because it's one of these situations where, like, all things being equal, the sort of default outcome going into this transfer window would be that Dan O'Reilly would stay at the Rovers. He'd said he was enjoying himself. Ian Murray said he quite fancied it. The Rovers have got all the knowledge that they need. They know how much they're paying him now. They know presumably how much he wants. So if the outcome of that is that he's gone somewhere else, then, as you say, it's kind of fair play. You know, either someone's offered him more money than the Rovers were offering or um, a longer deal, which seems to be the, the kind of narrative. And again, it's it's kind of fine. Ian Murray and John Potter and these guys, they've got all the information. So if they mm. don't feel like they are prepared to offer them that length of deal for whatever reason or offer them the, the money that Thistle are offering them, I'm quite happy to to go with that. And what you can't let yourself, what you can't let happen is to be, <laughs> not that I'm suggesting this has happened or or that Dan O'Reilly was trying this, but you kind of get yourself hauled over the coals on an 18-month deal because for a fortnight you've not got enough fit centre halves. Like that, I think, is the situation that um, Dunfermline are in at the moment. Mm -hmm. Granted, they've not got any fit players at all, but it's not as easy as just bringing in somebody. You've got to go window to window. You kind of just pack in all the guys for a fortnight. So um, you've got to think long term. That seems to be the, the ethos that the board are running with. So... I'm I'm the same as both of you. I think kind of disappointed by the headline that Dan O'Reilly has gone, but not particularly irked by the the detail of it all. It looks like it it probably makes sense for everyone. Can I just add in as well? Terrible, terrible day for everyone that was proposing that we were the Fife Gretna. Like just awful news for them. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. If if you wanted to chuck money about, you'd still have Dan O'Reilly. Quite yeah. simply. Um, uh, let's see, uh, John, you want to give us just your, your thoughts on, on the Dan O'Reilly situation? Well, just like echo the words of everyone else, a wee bit disappointed, but it was quite interesting all the way through that Ian Murray kept saying that he may have other offers on the table. You know, he flagged that up quite a lot, that um, it could well be that it was out of our hands all along. Um I think it's quite interesting he signed for Patrick Thistle because he's he's already scored for them this season, hasn't he? <laughs> he did pack a lot into his short-term deal. He scored an own goal and a yeah, goal really in the did. same game. Two goals, give you a penalty in another game. He yeah, did a lot. Um, Christina, how do you feel about the the kind of the situation with Dan O'Reilly and and just the, the defence at large at the moment? Um, I think if. Ross Millen hadn't had his red card, I would feel a bit more confident. I think my only concern is in the very, very short term, as in this Saturday and maybe the following. It's not like a long-term issue for me. I mean, I'm not overly gutted. He was good. I liked him a lot. I felt like he fitted in really well. When he came on his first match with Dunfermline, I felt like it looked like he'd played with us for much longer than one game. He fitted in perfectly. He obviously hyped himself up to get himself a deal that he wanted, which is good. But I think our board is very proactive. So I think they would have had that possibility in their mind and have something else planned, I would think, because they're quite on the ball with stuff like that. So, And then they announced Kyle Turner. So I think there's a bigger, a bigger plan. 
Yeah, and Ian, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm basically gonna turn that question to you and ask you to speak on behalf of the board almost here. But no, gut feel wise, do you think <coughs> we'll see another defender come in between now and the end of the window, or do you think this is a case of of Murray and the team looking at? Watson's coming back, you've got Dylan Corr there, you've got Adam Masson, Scott Brown has essentially transformed himself into a defender and there's enough to run with already. I see your point, but I do think we need another centre half. I do think we are going I, I, I do think we'll get one. Um let's call him L Ashcroft. <laughs> no, that's too obvious. <laughs> 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 so yeah, I I, th- I think we'll get another centre half. Um do you know what? Like, I, I'm not as disappointed as you guys that we lost O'Reilly because for me, it's a signifier of where we're at as a club now. We're not going to get held over a barrel for a player just because we need him in the short term. Do you know what I mean? Um, he is. Every player's got a value and we've offered him a deal that we thought was going to be of a relative value to his quality and he said, that's not enough for me, so we've said, okay, on you go. Do you know what I mean? You're free to go and speak to anybody else and, and take that deal that, that you think you're worth at another club. I don't think he's a Premiership quality defender. I don't think he would cut it in the Premier League. And we're currently top of the Championship. So the board are in a kind of strange situation. Well, not a strange situation, but they need to consider that. They need to weigh that up and say, if this guy wants an 18-month deal and in six months' time we're playing in the league above, he's not going to be good enough. So that needs to come into our thinking as well. And I think it probably has come into our thinking. And I think that's why he's no longer a player. It makes a lot of sense. And it's also, specifically for centre-halves, it is also a seller's market at the moment. Mm-hmm. There's multiple teams who need them. I mean, that... Like, <laughs> this is a real good week to be Dan O'Reilly's agent. But you've seen um, what I think we heavily suspect is uh, Dom Thomas's agent doing overtime at the moment in the papers, <laughs> trying, to, trying to rile up interest, despite the fact he's got 18 months left on his deal. Dundee United are interested. No, we're not. It's narrowed <laughs> down the search for Dom Thomas. As yeah, a certain we, journalist was saying to me earlier today. Not had active refusals from other players. Whereas when they came out and said, well, there's five teams in the championship, fancy Dan O'Reilly. That, like that, passed the smell test. You know, you look at that and you go, yeah, I can see that. That, that you know, a lot of teams could do with a, a big centre half. Somebody's going to chuck money out. See and if I think, you're, yeah, um... it makes sense. If you're going for like an ultimate selling point in terms of centre halves as well, we talk about O'Reilly's goals, but Ashcroft, I know that he's been linked with us and about three other teams <laughs> at our level. Um, we're, again, the highest ranked team that he can go for. He is previously a league winner, which O'Reilly's not to my knowledge. Um, and He's the type of player that could just push on. And we've done that with so many of our signings so far. So if he is available, I would be delighted to see if uh, see if he becomes one of our players. So, yeah. I was going to say that I'm no, I'm, I'm no so sure we will bring in another defender, you know. I really, not a centre-half. I can see us bringing in a full-back um, and, and looking to bring in a bit of width because that's probably the only place we don't have any cover. I mean, Ross Millen's out on Saturday. Who, who plays right-back? Not a right yeah. back. Do you know what I mean you might have a centre half in there, or you might have a right midfielder in there, or a centre midfielder in there, but you're not going to have a right back in there. If Liam Dick gets injured, who plays left back? You've not got another full back. So the idea of bringing in somebody who can play full back, who's maybe even potentially able to play on both sides, might be decent cover. Um, I mean, Dan O'Reilly, as good as he was, I think Robbie's kind of hit on the point I was going to make, which is experience. You've got Keith Watson coming back into the team, who's actually quite an experienced kind of seasoned professional. You've got Ewan Murray in there that's that's quite experienced. In terms of the senior players, Dan O'Reilly was probably the least seasoned of them all. Do you know what I mean? So if you're going to lose one of your centre halves, he's probably the one you don't mind losing too much. But personally, I mean, as much as I'd love to see Ashcroft come in, he's a good, really good centre half. I've I've always enjoyed watching him play. And um, to be fair, he's he's decent and he. I mean, did he not score an absolute screamer against us once? I'm sure he did. Surprise me. <laughs> I'm sure he did. But I'd love to see us bringing in. Personally, I'd love to see us bringing in a full back. Anybody who can play potentially right or left back, because um, that's the one place where there's no competition. There's no cover really, other than makeshift. 
Yeah. The other thing you might find is that the um, game away at Livingston might dictate what happens in the last, um, to some degree it will dictate what happens in the last 10 yeah. days of the window as well. Um, we saw it in last season, they took a, a, a I was going to say an, un, like an unusual gamble, and then I remember we're talking about Ian Murray, and it's absolutely not. It's a, it's a right down the line characteristic gamble of bringing in Isma and Chalvez immediately before the big cup game. But it, yeah. it took us, I mean, um, for whatever faults you might want to lay at him, he more or less paid for himself with mm-hmm. um, the contribution that he had in that game, helped us kind of over the line and got us into the next round. I mean, it is all he did, but to be fair. <laughs> well, no, he also he also strained the uh, strained the backs of two uh, stretcher bearers <laughs> up at Inverness. I really but, enjoyed, um, just very quickly, on, on social media, there was a Pars review or one of these kind of I phenomena saw accounts. That. I saw that. Up. You know, on your, your Twitter, you get the For You kind of yeah. section so it's not uh, something I follow but it's obviously like Scottish Championship so pop up it pops a thread of who Dunfermline should sign I thought this is going to be good it's when Danny Riley was in there I was Danny going to Riley say was in there. and then they've literally quote tweeted themselves oh 15 minutes ago he signed for Patrick Fissel it's like yeah. It was the Isma one though so I quote tweeted that I was like I agree completely I <laughs> should definitely spend money on this boy bring him in Marta. yeah but on uh on the, the topic of bringing players in, much more exciting than yeah. uh, Partick Thistle defenders. Not bothered. Former Partick Thistle midfielders, much more exciting. Uh, yeah. Kyle Turner popped up out of nowhere. Uh, or, well, he popped up into the, the reception at five windows and doors uh, <laughs> in the first instance. Um, uh, boy, let's, let's stick with you then. Give me your thoughts on, uh, on Kyle Turner. I thought uh, it absolutely made up, but just on that five windows and doors, he looked so confused. <laughs> that interview, <laughs> the interview with Davey Hancock, it was that kind of, why am I, am I buying a door? Um, no, I thought it was, I think it's a great bit of business. Really, really good. And I am so impressed that we've done it this early. I genuinely didn't think if we were getting a player like him, we were going to get him before, actually before the Scottish Cup. I thought a player of that kind of calibre was going to be tail end of the window, you know, the Premier League teams are all on their winter break, they come back for the Scottish Cup and traditionally that's when you start to get the loan market moving. The fact that we've done it this early is really impressive and speaks volumes for just how much he dislikes Derek Adams. Yes, John's pal Derek Adams, (laughs) apparently. um, Winning friends and influencing people up in uh, in Dingwall. Um, John, give give me your thoughts on... uh, on Kyle Turner, another another body into the midfield, which is interesting. Yeah, a very good player, a, a player that we've we've all looked at and thought he could do a job for us. You know, even going back to Stranraer days when he was a youngster, yeah. um, very good signing, very good signing. Um, I, we've had conversations on the here before about how we're going to fit all these players in and. I think that's another one that comes into that category. You know, where do you fit him in with, with everyone else, you know? But good signing, good signing. Good guy to have on board. And he also has a good dislike for a certain West Fife team as well. So <laughs> never a bad move in my eyes. Quite right. Um, Ian... We're maybe maybe getting a sneak preview of the uh, starting elevens that we're going to go through at some point um, in this episode. But how do you see Kyle Turner being used by Ian Murray, predominantly? It's a good, it's a good question. It's a very good question. Um, c- because we've primarily been playing that kind of four-two-three-one. Is his best position the ten? Yeah. Would you say that's still his best position? Everyone else. Yeah, like <laughs> it's kind of where, where about do we fit him in? I guess like I, it's a difficult one because obviously we are so well stacked in that area. But I think for the club and for Ian Murray, when a player of that caliber and that quality becomes available, and you're able to get them in, you get them in and then worry about where you're going to play them afterwards. Is this guy going to improve our team? And is he going to get us more goals and create more chances? Yes. Great. Let's get him in. I think it's a super signing. He was superb last season. Like, genuinely right up there with with the best players in the championship. 
uh, terrific signing. There, there also, I imagine, will have been a host of clubs after him. I think when the, you know, when the jungle drums go out that he's available from Ross County, I think pretty much every club in the championship are saying, yeah, blah blah bit of that. So for us to for us to to bring him in, I think speaks volumes about one how well the club's doing, and two how much he wants to come and be a part of it, which I think will will kind of feed into uh, how well he's going to do. But delighted to see him in uh, a player that I've liked for a long, long time, as you kind of touched on. I think a player that I think Davy touched on in his interview with him as well, where he kind of said like you're a player in a Wraith Rovers mould, and I really resonated with that. I think it's just someone who who I think fits our football club. Um, I think he'll do really well. I can't wait to see him get get going, and I think he might start. I think he might start on it on Saturday. Uh, yeah, I think so too. Um, I think the what you said there about you know when the the kind of word goes out that he's available, the Championship clubs all kind of the, their ears are all prick up. I think if it wasn't for the fact that obviously Ross County aren't going to let him go to a rival, I think the likes of your um, like David Martindale and Craig Levine, had he been available to them. I think they would take a chance on a Kyle Turner. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's, he's proven quality. Out. They, they, absolutely, you'd take him. And, and um, I mean, that's the thing. It's staggering that um, Ross County can't find a use for him. Um, it's obviously that's just just arrogance. Uh, on the well, that's of the Derek thing. Adams. Their fans know that they can use him, and they all comment that he's an excellent player. Yeah. It's just that Derek Adams, and I'm not sure if this will pass Derek Adams' swear test or not, so he might want to tell <laughs> tune out at this point. Derek Adams is a fud. So, Kyle, welcome to the Rovers. Come on in, son. We're very happy to have you. And uh, if he doesn't want you, we will gladly take you on board because, I class act. Brilliant player. Just ever since Stran Rar has it's been touched on before. We've sort of been around about his level throughout that time, um, and he's just always looked very comfortable on the ball, very tidy. Um, got into the championship team of the season last last year, and just overall, him and I think really Grant Savory from um, that was at Queens Park. The two of those just looked like the types of players that you wanted in your team, and uh, yeah. last season really stood out. So, yeah, I was. Um... I was listening to the Terrace podcast earlier, um, the kind of lower league episode of that, and uh, Craig Telfer was digging out boring pie and Bovril user random guy, the St. Johnson supporter. <laughs> Love that man. And Love that to man. To be fair, very, very boring. However, what he does have is a very unique line in kind of statistical analysis. So for anyone who's not seen this, he seems to have at his fingertips a kind of pinwheel... A graphic for any football player you've ever heard of and it makes for a very easy comparison and uh, his sort of opening salvo on the news that Kyle Turner had uh, signed for the Rovers was that the two most similar players that he matches up against, it's Dylan Easton and Regan Hendry yes please, I'll have some of that like <laughs> you can't get better than that. That's that's what you're after. No, you can't, yeah. Um for, for someone to go into this midfield. Like that's that's exactly it. And I think um to the point in terms of where he's gonna be used, I think what we'll see is kind of a return to the four one three two. He's and Sam that Kyle Turner's gonna be yeah, he's gonna be asked to do what Sam Stanton is doing. That again it raises the question of maybe the club know internally something about Sam Stanton with yeah. injury wise, is it gonna be maybe a bit longer than nah. what we're expecting? I know we we've sort of joked before about the Keith Watson situation where he's taken longer to come back. It was initially stated to be three weeks, but then again, I know that he had to have a, a sort of tidy up in terms of um inside the knee, I think it was in, for his injury, but might well I think be the case, this, might not be. See, for me, I think what this does is, I, I'm not so sure there will be anything quite as, as deep as that, but I think it takes the pressure off Sam Stanton coming back in. So ah. Sam Stanton comes back to fitness and he can play 20 minutes at the end of a game, he can play half an hour, he can play his way back into fitness. Whereas, like, and we've talked about it a lot when this season when players have come back from injury, we haven't had to throw them back in. You know, your Jack Hamilton's and your Jamie Gullins. This is probably, and I need to touch as much wooden things as I can, but Jamie Gullins probably the best run of fitness he's had for a good while for us because he's not getting, well, he's not getting a game, to be fair, but he's, he's also not getting flogged. Do you know what I mean? And it's that thing of when Sam Stanton comes back, if you chuck him straight back into the mix and he does it again, you lose him for another 8, 9, 10, 12 weeks. Do you know what I mean? Whereas now, 
he's got a genuine, not replacement, but a genuine alternative. Where, because I think you're right, Duncan. Murray wants to play four one three two. He doesn't want to play four two three one. He wants yeah. to play with two up front, and he wants the one in the midfield. But to do that, he needs he needs somebody who can change the game and control the tempo of the play. In a defensive sense, he's got Sean Byrne, and in an attacking sense, he had Sam Stanton. And I think now Kyle Turner fills that void. It's someone who can go sort of backwards and forwards. Yeah. Was that the thing with we've said with 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 Lewis Vaughan, when you play him as a number 10, he's only ever facing forwards. Yeah. Because that's his game. He's a striker you're asking, really, to, to drop back. Kyle Turner can play everywhere. Yeah. Like, really, I, I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> really oh, strongly believe that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge, huge fan of Kyle Turner. I'm still actually a little bit surprised that we've got him. Just mm. it feels like the, the sort of... Like this is why we can't have nice things, but well, this is a nice thing. We, we've got uh, we've got Kyle Turner. Um, is that not so somewhere I'm, inside your head? You still can't quite believe we're top of the championship, though. Yes, <laughs> very much so. There's like loads of stuff like that keeps happening, and I'm like, I'm I'm not nah. convinced this could possibly be real. I'm going to wake up tomorrow, and we'll be eighth. Not even the not even the excitement of a playoff to look forward to. Um, Right, Christina, if you could uh, give us any thoughts you want to give us about Kyle Turner and then also please take us into the game on Saturday and what you're thinking ahead of the um, the visit of, uh, of Queen's Park. Yeah, so I know absolutely nothing about Kyle Turner, so the whole Five Windows and Doors thing confused me when they put up <laughs> like, the Five Five Windows and Doors. I'm like, I thought I'm confused. It's a sponsorship thing. Are we getting a little bit more info about Five Windows and Doors? And then in comes Kyle Turner. So I basically just gone on what he said in his interview, um, which was a lot about game time, wanting to win games, which I liked because I didn't know whether that was meant to be more about the fact that we have obviously equalised a lot from winning positions and he's saying we want to win, which is a good sign for me as opposed to equalising constantly. The tweets from that I had a look at from the Ross County side of it, all the fans seem to really like him, which is great. Sad to see him go. Again, another good point about, we're talking about Dan O'Reilly potentially being in the Premiership in six months. He's come from a Premiership team, so it's a good sign that the club are thinking if we're going to be there, it's a good match for us, which is great. Interesting to see if it's one of those where Ian Murray wanting to have more in the midfield so that there's less pressure on the defence if we've lost a defender. I don't know whether that was a train of thought. Then there's more going on in the midfield to get the ball to the strikers as opposed to pressure on the defence. Um, so, yeah, I think he will start on Saturday. He is in my lineup for Saturday. Um, I had to look back this afternoon at the first Queen's Park highlights in September, and I feel like that game set the tone of this season mm-hmm. with the Lewis Vaughan goal, just everything about that. I feel like that kind of been our tone set from that point. And I looked at the stats, Queen's Park, they drove us 10 wins to us, 2 to Queen's Park, and 1 draw. So I definitely feel like we're going to win on Saturday. My prediction is 3 now. All right, we'll which we can take to the bank, having your uh, <laughs> previous sacrilegious final Airdrie win at the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, Robbie, why don't you... <laughs> in fact, uh, you can have the poison chalice. Why, you can be the first one to try and give us a back four, please. Absolutely not. I'm not even bothering with that. I'm just going to pie you there so you can move on to someone else. Fine. Fine. I will give you my back four. Good. Um, right. I am working on the assumption that Kevin Dabrowski is going to be back for this. Um, yeah. Just before I go actually into the back four itself. Uh, obviously, if he's not, I would expect Andy McNeil to keep his place. Um, mm-hmm. We're still, still not entirely kind of sure what the deciding factor between McNeil and, and Robbie Thompson was, but Andy McNeil didn't do anything wrong at Airdrie. I, I can't see playing a, a third goalkeeper in three consecutive games. So um, hopefully Kevin Dabrowski, if not, perfectly happy with Andy McNeil. Um, Liam Dick, presumably, will keep his place. I'm hoping Ewan Murray's going to be back, but if not, I think his place has to go to Dylan Corr. <laughs> presumably. Um, Scott Brown, I am almost certain, will play in defence in this one. And yep. then 
personally, and I think we could almost name a different player each for this, but for me, I'm going to go Scott McGill at right back. I agree. Which is more, I suppose, my yeah. preference over necessarily what Ian Murray might do, but that's that's what I would be looking at. Um, well, yeah, let's let's kind of stick on the defence because that's where all the that's where I think all the a lot of the talking points are. Um, Blair, come in on on that, please, and who you think? Yeah, might... as I just said, I, I completely agree, Duncan. I think you, you've hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what I would do as well. The um, I suppose the alternative at right back would be Josh Mullen after the Inverness game. Um, where he did do okay. My only concern with McGill is McGill played left back at um, Hamden for a very short period of time when Dick. Now, was Dick off injured? Or I can't no. remember what actually happened. No, he took him off as a, as a oh, no. gamble. Murray was sent no, off sent. and Dick went in the centre half. And their two goals, so obviously we won 3 2, but their two goals from a 1 0 lead. Their two goals were both down that side, and it was our friend and yours, Dom Thomas, um, completely exploiting the fact that McGill is a decent footballer and he's he's a hard worker and he runs and he's energetic and he can tackle and everything you want, but he's not a fullback. And I think my only concern about Saturday is, although it's the other side, so whether Dom Thomas would actually swap sides or not, I don't know. But my only worry is that they they might exploit the fact that whoever we put in at right back is not going to be a fullback. Um is is my concern because he, he peeled I think I talked about it on the, the show just after that game where he, he Don Thomas peeled so wide, like wider than you would ever go normally in a game. And we know how wide Hamden is. Paint on the boots. Um, yeah, mm. but it was literally paint on the boots. And McGill with the best one in the world, McGill just didn't know what to do. And you can't blame him because it's not his job. Um, but yeah, I, I think I would do the same. I genuinely would. Um, anybody want to give me a hands up? Are they are they playing? Are they not playing Scott McGill at right back? I've got Mullen. I've got him in there. Going for Mullen. Yeah, and actually, can I just say I put Liam Dick in? That <laughs> good first time. Um, so I've put Mullen in, and then I've put Turner in because I'm thinking he's going to get a start. Um, Easton and Burn. And then Vaughn, Smith, Hamilton. And I don't think... Dubrovsky up front. I don't think Dubrovsky is up front. I don't think Dubrovsky <laughs> is going to be back, actually. So I've put um, McNeil back. The um, only other one I just want to mention, just, just before we leave the right back behind, just because we've not mentioned him yet, but I think he is a viable option, is Adam Masson. He's the mm-hmm. other one in the squad who we've seen appear at right back before. He's the one, I think, that if you're... If your main concern is defensively, I think he's the pick. I think he's he's the way to go. But it's not kind of um not generally my preference. I think you lose too much going for a centre half at right back. Um I, and I don't again I don't know if he, do I, either. I don't know if he rectifies that problem though, because it's that same thing of a centre half's kind of natural instinct is to, to to go central. Like and it's that thing of your your full back knowing when they need to go. And actually, more than anything, I think your fullback controls your midfielder. It's pulling them in and saying, no, nah, he's too wide for me. You're picking him up. I'm staying in here and doing this. And I think your centre-half might do that better. But, yeah, I'm not, sure it, I'm not sure it fixes the problem. I suppose what I was thinking, if you think of the goal we conceded at Inverness, where it's like the yeah. ball's kind of beyond core... And it's Over Mullen's the top. just not quite because again, because it's it's not his job. That's probably the kind of scenario where Adam Masson probably does defend that. Mm. But you're right in terms of if he's been dragged out to the touchline by someone like Dom Thomas, who is gonna have the ball, you know, under your feet and like like Dylan Easton would. But yeah. I suppose that ultimately we 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 don't have a good option for that, as you said earlier on. We literally do not have another right back, um, even if it was on the other side we could at least be having this conversation in relation to Callum Hanna, where you're saying like, mm-hmm. oh, he is a left-back. It's just a question of experience or not. Whoever plays right-back is um, is going to have to fill in. But um, I- I'll give you the rest the rest of my lineup uh, quickly. So as I say, um, hopefully Dubrovsky in goal. Uh, Dick, hopefully Murray, uh, Brown and McGill across the back four. Uh, I then have Sean Byrne holding kind of on his own. 
um, with a, a debut for Kyle Turner ahead of him. I've gone Callum Smith on the left-hand side ahead of Dylan Easton. Dylan Easton's had a lot of football recently by his own very high standards. You know, a little bit off the boil, probably fair to say, over the last couple of games. Mm. Um, on the other side, I think you have the perpetual kind of toss-up between um, Aidan Connolly and Josh Mullen. Um, I have written Josh Mullen could have just as easily put Connolly. I actually have no real <laughs> preference on that. Like, I just, whoever out the tunnel first. This place. is one that I would actually be quite vocal about, but I'll come back to this in a minute. All right, well, I'll tell you very quickly then, I've got Vaughan and Hamilton up front. So, in you go. Yeah, um, so I was listening to earlier on Spider Talk, which is the Queen's Park podcast, and they were talking about their recent games. Um, under the, the sort of temporary coach they had who'd been brought in as the head of youth from Europe now, um, they mentioned that the goals that they conceded in the game against Park Vessel, I don't know if it'll be the same sort of coming up now that they've got Davidson and if he's going to change the formation. But they mentioned that he was playing sort of a 3 5 2 uh, with two wing backs and that they were really exposed in the sense that they were playing Dom Thomas up top um, alongside Rory Payton, which was a change that I was found quite surprising. Um, so that might help us on the, the wing-back situation if that's the case. But I know it's been mentioned before that Callum Davidson does love a winger. Uh, they did say, though, that the main issue for them was balls coming into the box. So I would be quite keen to see Josh Mullen start him. Um, and if we're getting corners, they said particularly sort of balls going back stick were a real issue for them, just with knockdowns, balls coming in, and that's how they lost lost their goals. So, again, you can't really rely on previous games and Park Thistle are a different side to us, so whether we would have the, the sort of aerial impetus and that's what I mentioned about Dan O'Reilly, I think that he's going to be a big loss for this game um, for us, not just being a centre-back, but also that attack and threat that got touched on before. Um, but at the same time, there are other lads that can step up. We know Jack Hamilton's scored against um, recently, it was at Arbroath that he got the header for the second goal. Um, and then you've got Ewan Murray as well. If he's potentially back, then he's an aerial threat. So there is lads in there. Ian, um, even Liam Dick can offer a bit of um, sort of going forward at corners and things like that. So, aye, just an intriguing game. I think that it's one where it'll just be... Really, it's one of those games where it's two sets of very good attacking players against two defences that are going to be... Their defence is very inexperienced based on what I heard. They had a few... A lot of very young lads at the back, so keen to see how that shapes up against such an experienced front line that we've got. Just when you mentioned uh, set pieces there, we didn't say it. Kyle Turner, another one. Excellent set piece there. So, mm. I mean, they're, they're going to have to... I don't think um, <clears throat> Rock, Paper, Scissors is going to cut it for some of these free <laughs> kicks now. They're going to have to come up with a... A, a, a system that works for three or four different people to decide that. Vaughan a rock petting rock a leather, leather spock. <laughs> yeah, that, that'll work. <laughs> um, Ian, uh, give me your thoughts just on the, on the the rest of the lineup and just generally how you feel about um, about Queens Park. Then, yeah, my thoughts on the lineup are that none of us will get it right. Um, I'm, 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 That's I'm why I didn't try. Pretty, pretty <laughs> confident in that. Going strong. <laughs> yeah, pretty confident. Like it's, uh, yeah, it could, it could be anything to us. I've gone McNeil, uh, Miguel Brown, Cor, Dick, then Holden, Bun, and Matthews. Then across the three, Connolly, Vaughn, or Turner, um, and then Easton, and then Hamilton up front. But realistically, it just means absolutely zero because it's not going to be that. <laughs> So, I think um, sorry, Matthew, Matthew would be an interesting start to shout though. Uh, or yeah, I think, he, start, I think he might start there. Uh. He did well when he came on at Airdrie. I think he snapped into a couple of tackles and I thought he moved the ball pretty well and uh, it was quite, there, there was there one was in particular one. player I, I know the one you're oh, oh, oh my yeah. god it was so good it was I like Ross Matthews welcome back yeah it was off my feet <laughs> like, uh, uh, <laughs> a great challenge um, it's what he's all about kind of Brown kind of gives you a bit of that, but Matthews has got that kind of that extra Aye. little bit of bite and dynamism about him, and that like, it was uh, it was great to see. So I'd be really keen to see him back in the starting lineup, and I think he will start. I thought he did enough to impress Murray in that kind of wee wee cameo Airdrie. So yeah, um, mind when, uh, to see a bit mind of when he drop kicked Joe Cardinal in a Jarby, was it? Yeah, it's a very good photo. Tremendous. Of that. <laughs> 
Yes. It wasn't um, even a drop kick, then, it was like a sort of flying scissor kick. There yeah. was a real <laughs> technique behind it. Sweet uh, music. Did, I, did, did I see something online that Rudy Payton is suspended or he's injured or have I, have oh, I made that up entirely? Nobody seems to be able to um uh, with respect to our, our Texan pal, nobody <laughs> seems to be able to actually kind of Figure present a copy of the rules. If you Google like SPFL suspension rules, it comes up the PDF, but it's like four years old. Yeah. And um it's just shrouded in, in mystery. So he's had I think he's now tipped over whatever the original suspension threshold is. <laughs> But there's a question mark over whether or not that gets extended to 12 bookings at the end of the year. I honestly think we're going to have to wait for the team lineups to find out. No, um, if, he's if, if, if he's missing, that's a huge miss for them. Like I'm just kind yeah. of glancing my eye over the BBC kind of top scorers. He's got 14. He's got year. exactly and the same stats as Lewis Vaughan, apparently. Has like, he really? Has he really? I, the only reason, apparently, is ahead is something like minutes. He's played less minutes or something along those yeah. lines. I really like Rudy Payton as a player. I'm glad that I listened yeah, to good. another podcast to do all my research here. They've, they've done something <laughs> solid for this. Yeah. Shout out yeah, to they, they, are, they, are, they are the worst team in the league for me. They're the worst team that, that I've certainly seen well, a play. I think, yeah, yeah, they've kind of, obviously they won last week. They got the win against, a, a very funny win against them, Fairland. They've now replaced their, uh, their joke of a manager with someone who could be actually quite competent, so... Uh, we may see a bounce there, I was going to say fingers crossed not I think I think Carl Davidson will do quite well in there actually I think that's a really good appointment for them yeah um, I think given that they apparently or they appear from the outside now to have ditched the project um, in favour of actually trying to win games um, I think they, they, they'll probably see a bit of a bounce maybe not this week is the hope you know sometimes the manager bounce doesn't happen straight away um, it maybe takes a week or two to bed in but um, I just I look at our team on Saturday, like the defence. The other thing about bringing Turner in is that it frees up Scott Brown, obviously, like you said, Duncan, to go back in at centre half. But for me, the the one will be Burton, and then it will be Turner in front of him in the Stanton role, and then you can just basically roll a dice and pick whoever you want in front of that. Um, I think Vaughn um, will probably start Hamilton. I would imagine will start as the the two up top. I'm kind of with you, Duncan, as well, with, with um, Easton. I mentioned it before the, the Airdrie game. I was quite surprised to see him start against the Airdrie, actually. But I'd like to see um, Connolly come back in. I think he's done enough. Like he, he, he deserves the chance to come back in and kind of get going again, um, whether it's Mullen that drops out or Easton that drops out. But um, I'd like to see Connolly start. Yeah. Just um, just a few kind of stray thoughts on this. First of all, on Ross Matthews, did play a couple of games at right back for John McGlynn, if you want to add sure. another name to the uh, Wheel of Fortune of who's going to play at right back. Yep. Um, Callum Davidson, I think, is going to be interesting at Queen's Park. Because like, he won two trophies in the same season for St. Johnston. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm right in saying in the same year, they scored nine goals at home in the league the entire yeah. season. Yeah. Which... It feels silly in the extreme to say that winning two trophies is papering over the cracks, but they were <laughs> that, by no means kind of all conquering. They, they, and and towards the end of the, his time at St. Johnson, they were terrible. So it'll be interesting to see. I know they they've been linked with. Um, is it Sean Welsh? Um, Aye, the Callum yeah. player Callum that's injured. That's bizarre. Yeah, I mean it's it's one He's of these decent. things where you think he fits the right kind of profile in terms Except of his experience and you, you need mm -hmm. somebody into that midfield but he's never available um, no, it's de I mean, he's I watched... decent, why is he Why is he getting released by Ember at this point in the season I, he's he's wages. Wages. Sean, Sean's been wanting to, I know he's he's been wanting to get back down the road of course he, what <laughs> of course he's the most connected man <laughs> I'm a Tiwi's postman this week. What are you talking about? We could make a reference to like North Korea and John. Oh, I once met Kenny Osung. Go on, John, tell us. He's one down the road. No, I'm not speaking now. That's the first. He's, um, he's, he's looking to get back down the road. I spoke to him up at Inverness um, after we won up there. Um, so he's he's got he's bought a house in Trinane. 
um, I hope it's not Stuart Milton one, but um, <laughs> he's uh, got a house there and uh, he's looking to get back down the road, so it, it would um, suit his situation at the moment. I think his wife's um, in the process of moving down there, um, so that would suit him. I think to answer your question, Blair, like he's, he's definitely good enough that mm. mean, that he shouldn't have been needing to look at leaving Calais, but also his injuries have been poor enough. That I think the mm. injury record, sorry, poor enough that they're That's probably fair. not overly gutted to, to see him go. But um, I watched that Queen's Park game against Dunfermline, and I thought they were really poor. Yeah. Although they won that game, I mean, the Dunfermline squad by the end was like the it was like the action man been at a charity shop. It was just like <laughs> <laughs> bent legs and everything just like cobbled together. What a and, great uh, analogy. <laughs> they, and I, I just Queen's Park I thought were really, really poor. It was like um nine like nine children just kind of run about trying their best and Aye. then Dom Thomas and Rudy Payton. Who are really, really good players. And to be fair, the goalkeeper's decent as well, Callum Ferry. Yes, I am. But the rest of them, just regens, like, and it's not seeing qual- Jack Spong, like, not even, <laughs> like, I mean, fine. Like, so, I just think that. He's probably one of the most experienced players now. Yeah. <laughs> He's been playing with them for almost all of this season. Uh-huh. I just, I think that they're they're not a good side. Uh, Ian Murray said in his interview today, he said that he thought they were in a false position at the bottom of the league, and I'm like, well, for me. who are you putting below them? Inverness, our bro. <laughs> there you go. They're, they're at least <laughs> well, I suppose they're they're all right. Have they made the right. playoffs? As, as um, a personally, <laughs> as a person that really, really dislikes Greenock Morton, to give them their due over like the last yeah. month and a half. They've been churning out the results. Yeah, Morton, just really Morton's a funny one. Annoying, Morton are like... not a good side by any stretch of the imagination, but they are effective. That Aye. style of football, and that's to be fair, that's what Arbroath. They, Arbroath nearly won the league doing that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. They, they, it's it's an effective way to play in this league. If you're up against a team who can't defend set pieces and they can't hit their balls, you're you're always going to have a bit of joy with them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I mean, look at them going to Dundee United last week. They absolutely bullied them. I but, say that. I'm glad we're not playing Morton this week. Yes. Morton, um, Morton for me aren't a football team. They're a gang. They come yeah. along and beat you up, as you yeah, see. That's why I hate Morton, by the way. I just hate the way they play football. <laughs> and I absolutely cannot stand watching Diggy Emery in any way, shape, or form. He's comedy. He's comedy value. Dear. It'd, be, it'd be more comedy if he didn't go on these really, really good runs. Like, what, know, it's what, annoying, what, isn't it? Annoying, like, competent sometimes. The funny about <laughs> yeah. them is the fact that each time their fans, um, particularly over the last like four months, the results have been poor up until maybe like, a month and a half ago. So the results are poor. And then everyone's going, well, you've got Kurt Broadfoot at the back and he's a cart horse. And you've not really replaced like um, you've kept choosing them. And their fans are going, well, maybe Emery's lost a bit of a shine. Then they pick up a few results and then they all go on and start greeting again, like, oh, people just keep on going about how we're big physical Morton, we're more than that. And it's like, no, you're really not. You're just a couple of big lumps up top. Robbie Muirhead seems to bang in hat tricks despite just being a big, just a lump. And same for George Oakley. It's just, I've got full respect for it, right? I really do. But you can't, you can't look at those goals they scored again. The third one in particular. Aye. I mean, he's basically just like dunking Kevin Oakley in the face until he falls over. (laughs) (laughs) As as the ball's coming down, like it's, it's absolutely the epitome of as you so eloquently put it, Robbie. They have gone up to Tanadice and they've just rustled a few jimmies <laughs> and come away with three points. That's Brilliant. that's Greenock Morton. And yeah. if, if they embraced it, it would be fine. It's the fact but, that they get so uppity about it. And um, Broadfoot's still at it, because you see the decision that they had for the... Uh, Kevin <laughs> yeah. Holt, he wrestles him to the ground. Holt gets back up and bullets in a header to put it... It would have been their third goal. <laughs> 
and then for some reason the referee waves the other way, which from our point of view, absolutely hysterical because it gets us a, a really favourable result when we needed it. So, aye. In saying that, in saying that I, thought, I thought Holt fouled Oakley in the, the lead up to his third goal as well. He had a big He's certainly trying to. Jim Goodman came out and complained about it and it's like, that's Morton. Who did you think yeah. you were playing? Totally. Like, you can't even... I was going to say, is he in danger of wrestling us back to a Queen's Park preview? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's really funny that you you, you basically said, Duncan, that, that Queen's Park are wrong, right? And you're absolutely right. But do you remember our half-season or quarter-season preview when we, we went through... It was the Arbroath game that never happened, the one I presented... And we were kind of going through the performances and the teams that, we, and we were waxing lyrical about Queens Park because actually, although we beat them two one that day, they were really good. And Aye. I mean, they got a man sent off. One of the centre halves got sent off for hauling down Jack Hamilton on the halfway line. Too, but they were it? actually really, really good. Yeah, wasn't well, it three that's two? the thing as well. Was it three two? I think it was three oh, two. Three two, sorry, yeah, three two. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, for all for all we're talking about this as well, you can't have any complacency about it from our side because realistically, we've gone into those games and we've came out with two last minute winners. Yeah. Like they've given us games. Really yeah, fine. When they were down at that game at Starch Park, they got sent down to the, what down to ten men, and then they started playing better. It was really yeah. again. Not the first team to do that, or last team to do that. But. I don't think it's going to be like that at all on Saturday, though. I think, that's why I said to you now, I think it's going to be very straightforward on Saturday. I think there's no... That's enough for me. Start. We're going to pump them. <laughs> Christina, and, and I hate to do the whole been watching Rovers for a long time, but that's when it falls apart, pal. That's that's the moment when you when you go into a game thinking, here we go. I'm that's when the bad things happen. Well, this is on that point. On Saturday, there's going to be no roller coaster, no emotions, no heart pain. Straightforward, three 0 That's what I said. That's so, what I said about our growth. Well, about yeah. Airdrie, Christina said one 0 Airdrie, and it was. And I said three 0 Rovers, and it certainly was not. It was not. this week. Christina said 3 0 Rovers, so I am confidently predicting Wraith Rovers <laughs> nil, Queen's Part 1. <laughs> See, just on this point, right, I'm going to come in here because I've noticed a few kind of things across various social media platforms and at the game as well, actually, on Saturday. Just yeah. so much negativity, man. So much. People are almost like waiting on it falling apart. Rovers Aye. fans. And I don't know if it's just because it's like inherently built into them that we expect it to happen, but. See, for me, right, this season is as good as it gets. We're going for a championship title. It's like, we're not going to win the Scottish Cup. We're not going to win the League Cup. And winning this would be better than winning the Challenge Cup. So, like, see if you can't enjoy this. What are you going to enjoy? Like, I, I, I do not get it. Like, let's get behind the team. Like, see, on Saturday, man, there was just like this, this, like... There was one guy that was sitting right behind me and was really getting on my nerves, which has probably swayed me slightly on this opinion. But <laughs> Jesus, man, like let's just let's believe, let's believe we're going to do it, and like see when things aren't going well in the park. That's when the boys need us. That's yeah, when the players on the park need us to be getting behind them, and like that's when we can really be a force for good. We've got the increased home crowd. Let's make it a positive rather than a negative. I just think that the the, the fans in general could be doing a, a wee bit more to get behind the team, but. Let's actually believe that, that, that we're in a title race here and it's a good thing and, and let's enjoy it. Let's absolutely enjoy it because Steve, this Steve, does not come uh, along very often. We need to enjoy it. No, it doesn't. Go to that point, really I didn't doesn't. mention this on the, the post-match Dunfermline. Maybe they touched on it, but see that section down the front and I know this will probably get a few, like, people will probably be jumping in the comments saying, well, that wasn't in the situation for me. That section down the front was bouncing and there was nobody, no instance, fortunately this time, Christina, with uh, any, anything getting chucked about flare-wise. It was all chucked down the front. They acted responsibly on that way. This I was the down there. So, yeah, yeah, the Pars game. Yeah. Um, like, I didn't see any any dramas, any instant, any dangers. Fair play to the lads down the front. They looked like they were having the time of their life and that's what we want to see. Again, you don't want to see flares getting chucked at other fans, which we've spoken about in great detail before. Nobody needs to dwell on that. It looked absolutely class, had a good time, everyone had a good day out. And that's what you want. You don't want to be sitting there. And again, I I'm fully agree with Ian. Like, I don't, wouldn't want to go to the football. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. But at the same time, 
guys are professional. Let's get behind them, give, give them support. And it does make a big difference when it is that. And they've spoken before about sort of the second half, get the ball sucked into the net in the, uh, in the south stand. There's so much to be positive about. And so, see, so much, just yeah. the fact really that we're is. bringing a player like Kyle Turner just for banter, yeah. basically. Just on the basis that, like, <laughs> we can. Eric Adams is a really good player. He can come in, make a huge difference. That wouldn't have happened a year ago. A year ago, we were like, oh, we've got this kid. John Frederickson, didn't he work? Willie Accio is Willie Accio. Yeah. Like, we're spoiled. Aye, we're spoiled rotten right now. We are spoiled yes. rotten right now. And I think, again, perspective's a, a huge thing. But yeah, I would really, really strongly echo uh, that point. And just yeah, same. I was just going to say that I think it's something we've mentioned before, and it's the thing that no Rovers fan really wants to say out loud, but getting promoted to the Premier League is great, right? I'd love for it to happen. I've seen it happen before. It was tremendous. Being in the Premier League when I was a kid was great. But the novel will wear off in the Premier League pretty quick. You know, if we get up and we survive a season and then we survive another season... We basically what become St Johnson, like the, there there is a limit to to where we're going to go. There is, I mean, we're yeah. we're never we're not going to win the Premier League, right? It's just Aye, well, that's not. See, so I'm just, I, just I'm going to be so devil's I, advocate here. Just uh, I'll carry on. I'll let you. I'm no, going to come in as a devil's it's just, advocate. It's, it's, as much as getting to the Premier League would be great, and I would love it, and it would be it would be great to go to these grounds and experience all of that and stuff. I think Ian's absolutely hitting the nail on the head. This is, for a Rovers fan, probably the pinnacle. This is as good as it gets in terms of winning silverware, like actually challenging for something, which it is for, and let's be honest, it is for all but seven or eight clubs probably in Scotland, if that, five or six. So I think the, the, the point Ian makes about if you can't enjoy this, why are you here? It's quite valid, actually. Like, if you can't enjoy this now, you've got some horrible times ahead of you. But at the same time, I would add in that there is a lot to be optimistic about and the, the of foundation of what's going on. And I get... We, say we do go up to the top flight. There is absolutely no reason that we can... There's absolutely reasons that we can build a solid foundation there mm -hmm. on a sense of like becoming a club like St Mirren and what they've done, or St Johnston going on and winning Scottish Cup, League Cups, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. If it's your season, it happens. Like you just need a bit of luck. The cup draws go for you, and then all of a sudden you find yourself in a, a quarter final, semi final at Hamden against Dundee United a few years ago. It was what a really good day out. Um, we came up against a very, very good Dundee United side, but then Ross County get to the final and you get that experience. And then since they've gone on to win cups, why can't we do that? So we can, we absolutely uh, can. But it's that uh, thing of that's that thing of a, a league campaign, like for for any club of our size and our stature and where we're at. Do you know what I mean a league a league campaign where you potentially win in the championship in a league where there's a team throwing money? Like that's the other thing. Yeah, like well, I, you know, it's well, like when we won the Challenge the... Cup. And, we won the Challenge Cup and we won it against Rangers. We won the Challenge Cup and we won it against Queen of the South. And the truth is, which one do you prefer? 100% the one against Rangers because it was against Rangers. Because yeah. you actually had to pit yourself against somebody. Do you know what I mean? And with the best one in the world, winning it in a league where Queen of the South are in it, like, it, it's not the same. It just isn't it. So winning the championship this season, potentially against a side that in, in Dundee United who are horsing money left, right and centre, Means more, like it, it genuinely does. If we'd won the league yeah. the year that we, the year that we ran, was it Kilmarnock close? Um, and the no, it was Dundee, wasn't it? The season, the first season up. Aye, in, Hearts, in Hearts won it comfortably. We got to the playoffs. We mm -hmm. beat the Pars in the playoffs, which That's was right, yeah. hilarious. Owen Fon Williams face first yeah. in the ground, um, and then we lost to Dundee at Starks and then beat them up at Dens and in the game at Starks we should have had a goal that got disallowed it was yeah. a tumultly mm -hmm. incident I, I just think yeah I think Ian's hit the nail on the head like we've, we've just got to and I, I said this a few weeks ago like I feel like I've earned this I have seen some yeah. utter dross over the years okay. like let's just embrace it Aye. yeah let's, absolutely there's, there's, there's maybe an element of we're running the risk of, of maybe overstating 
some of the kind of the negativity because that's not yeah. the overriding thing. I mean, I, Ian, I absolutely take your point because the thing is, for, for me at the moment, it's individuals rather than it being anything that's kind of systemic. Yeah. But the I thing agree. with some some people, man, just get, it's the thing for me. It's like it's the sense of entitlement. Yeah. yeah. Where it's like, what did you think would happen? When you bought a Wraith Rover season ticket, <laughs> at what point yeah. did you think you were buying into guaranteed success? Yeah. And like, because it's that kind of thing where, right, we get beat at Airdrie. I don't think we played terribly, to be honest with you, but we, we didn't play well by any means at all, and we were we were deservedly beat. Um, but <laughs> there's I folk getting they were all up at Airdrie. It was only one 0 like, It wasn't four 0 five 0 yeah. yeah, Exactly. Yeah. And it was it was the first defeat in fifteen game unbeaten run. Like it's yeah. exactly. Yeah, you that... literally can't win every game. You, you, you no. just are not going to do it. Dundee United are not doing it. You know, Rangers no. and Celtic are not doing it. You're not going to win every game. Yeah. Nah. That's it. And I think that's it's just retaining that kind of perspective. Which again, but, to be fair, I think the majority of people do. Yeah, the majority so. of people did um kind of clap the team off the park, apart from Ross Mellon, who was otherwise engaged. <laughs> um, but yeah, absolutely. I think there is there is a thing where sometimes it's like you, 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 you don't you don't earn the right to just because you've won 16 games, uh, not you've won 16, you've been unbeaten for 16 games, doesn't suddenly mean you've got any divine right to not be beaten the 17th time. Aye. That's not how the world works as much and as anything else. See, see, to add a final point on that, right? See if anyone can provide me with an explanation of the good that booing a player does or telling a player mm. that he's garbage. I am genuinely curious to hear. Because I've, again, I, I'll be completely transparent. I've worked in jobs where I've been told that, like, customer facing jobs where people give you abuse that does not make you work harder it, it has the complete opposite effect right and again yeah. for football players it's different there's and we'll there's a lot of tangible variables we won't be able to see because they're statistically based it's like much how we talk about with josh mullen and oh does he run enough and then all of a sudden the the stats come out and we say oh actually we were completely wrong about that there's no benefit to, to really slaughter in a player. And I get that it's going to happen because people get frustrated. Football's a tribal sport. This sort of thing comes in. But at the same time, just just grumble under your breath rather than tell yeah. them that they're, they're the worst player in the world. It's just, I, I don't understand it. But again, everyone's got their viewpoints. Everyone's entitled to their viewpoints. And hence why we've got a podcast. Can I just go back John. to what you were saying, Robbie Erler, about that group at the front of Dunfermline the last time they went? That group. I oh, don't slaughter them now. No, I'm <laughs> slaughtering them now. I'm backing them up. We were kind of to the right of them, further back, and they were great. They got the crowd up, standing up. Like when it went quiet, they were the ones that were leading it, and it was great. And I feel like that's that's what you want at a away game. You're not wanting somebody shouting abuse for 90 minutes. But You're that kind see, of see, for next season at Starks, I would love for them to have a section at the. Ideally, if they could do so, I get that you're going to have. Down the front, it's going to be a lot of people that have already got their season book tickets in that position already. But if they could put it to a vote and say among the fans, do you want to have a, a singing section? And say it was down the front left corner towards the main stand and get that area. If they could do that. I don't know like what it would be like for maybe disabled fans because I get that you've got issues in terms of going about Starks for, for people in that position. But at the same time, if they can get a bit where it's a corner and just have it sort of like as an ultra section and just sort of foster that and go for it and see so see how it works. The last last home, last home game, they had some of the community foundation in the main stand instead of over in the railway stand. They had them all kind of in the down the side and that worked really well. It felt like the main stand was a lot more full and atmospheric as well. I like that a lot. She continued to do that. I think the, the only caveat I would say to that is that the South Stands because it's more populous you'll get like you get you see a lot of the time and I, I think the others will say this like you'll see young guys in the South Stand maybe like 13 14 they'll be in the middle of the stand they'll see the group at the back pipe up and then all of a sudden they're like right I'm going up the back right why were we yeah. not involved there so I feel like that can be quite a key factor for it whereas if it's in the main stand again it's going to limit it so I still like um uh, Scott and Blair's idea from about 20 podcasts ago of uh, building like a pit in front of the yep. main stand. It's a real uh, real bear pit behind the dugout. Yeah. Um, right, anyway, I'm going to move us on a little bit because that was a, was a really good discussion. It was worthwhile, but um, we're taking up an awful lot of time. So um, I obviously 
uh, start of this episode, I, I, I ran through a, a fairly tongue-in-cheek list of uh, January loan signings. Uh, and you hear managers say all the time, it's, it's a difficult window to do good business in. But as we've just seen with um, Kyle Turner, it's not always all bad. Uh, so for tonight's big question, uh, I'm going to ask you relatively quickly, please, uh, to each give me your favourite January signing. And it could be a loan signing or a, or a permanent one. And um, John, let's start with you, please. Oh, um, I looked at the, the thing that was put up on our little uh, WhatsApp group and I think Regan Henry did in his first time came in in January but didn't get a game or hardly got a game. So You had to wait for three months. Yeah. <laughs> um, Wild. We, he did arrive in that. And, and um, who was it? Was it you, Blair, that said about Mark? No, it was Graham, Graham Meldrum. I'll, I'll yeah. come up with Graham's one of Mark Campbell came to us during the January window back in the, the days of Gordon Biel being the manager and uh, we all know what a good player he became for us. So he's my good one and then there's so many bad ones that we'd be here all night. Don't steal mine, John. Don't steal mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can have them. Yeah, I can see that your good one's bad everybody, bad. everybody else's bad one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Christina, come in on that then. Give us your, oh, uh, your January hero. I'm not even being sarcastic when I say this, right? I went, <laughs> what, what? I went back to the first season. I was at <laughs> but genuinely, Willis for Tadol. He. I bet right, nobody expected Christina to say that. Let me, let me <laughs> tell you the two things I remember at Willis for Tadol. Number one, he scored a belter of a goal at Hamden, and that one goal of the season, by the way, that did. It was very good. Two, I remember him running. Fast down the wing, and he did run fast down the wing. Maybe he only did it once, but he did. Chasing an ice cream van. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was scraping the barrel. I went to that one, right? I looked at the squad that year, and that was like that's just a sentimental team for me because that was the first team I ever watched. Greg Fenn, Liam Buchanan, Ian Davidson, Johnny Court, Bobby Barr, Jason. Clinton. All the stars. Bobby Vaz. So, yeah. Willis Furtado for me. Go with the season 2017 2018. I was going to say you can't argue with that, but you can't. Yeah, yeah, you, you, can. Can. yeah you definitely can. Internationally, you can't can. now. I would. Um, you know, I'm... People on Twitter, by the way, can type in on that. I want public vote. I want people to back me up on this. <laughs> wow. That's it. Uh, you'll be, be the only person. I was going to say the only person backing that up was Dario Valenti because he made a blooming fortune <laughs> off the boy. <laughs> um, right, very quickly, I'm, I'm going to give you mine because mine, mine is Regan Hendry, uh, as you mentioned. John, he was originally uh, a January signing. Barry Smith, presumably against his will, somehow took him on loan, <laughs> given that he then just summarily ignored him for uh, for two and a half months. Gave him a minute in a debut um, at Hamden against Queen's Park. And he kind of broke his broke his way into the team towards the end of that season. And I think we saw some glimpses of what was to come, but it was very much in his, uh, his subsequent spells that we really saw the uh, saw the best of him. Um, but, Robbie, you next, please. Yeah, um, I am looking back to the Ray McKinnon season where we were sort of... We middled along, but we were still doing relatively decent for the first half of the season. And we had John Daly and Craig White up top, which was rather unforgettable. Wow. Well, well, forgettably. Uh, What's the opposite of a strike force? Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, we really, we really sort of toiled along. We were doing decent. We'd had a good start to the season, but things there was a bit of a question whether we were going to drop off. And Morton, funnily enough, were sort of picking up a bit of pace um, having been promoted I think the season before and then in January we made a move for a recently released from Dundee United a certain Mr Aidan Connolly who came in and he looked absolutely sensational um, really did. again just very very quick off the mark um, added goals and assists into our team alongside Louis Longridge and then later on that season we brought in Ryan Hardy 
who has since kicked on and is doing very well for, for Plymouth uh, this season. And that sort of trio, um, along with the addition of rather randomly Joe Thomas, um, just yeah, saw us over the line, really good end to that season, which had a, a really unfortunate ending with Ray McKinnon leaving very, very quickly after that defeat to Hibs in the playoffs as soon as he realised yeah. the Dundee United job was his. And with that team, I always sort of felt that there was a, a kind of what could have been to it if he'd stayed and, and we'd sort of gone forward on that basis with him remaining as manager and keeping that squad together. But unfortunately, it wasn't the case. Um, Connolly Hardy, went off. And, ha- I was going to say, Hardy would have been a January signing the year after as well, wouldn't he? That, Did he not go yeah, he was, Morton uh, and then he, he came back? Aye, and then he uh, he got told that he was all he would be the type of person that he would love to bring back your daughter to bring home with you by John Hughes. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Aye, not a good trainer though. Um, so <laughs> you had by that. All aye, it was just um, Connolly in particular though just stood out for that second half of the season. Just a really good player, and I'm glad that he's yeah. back now. So aye, yeah, definitely. Um, right, Ian, uh, let's have your uh, your January pick, please. Yeah, the same season as, as Robbie, actually, uh, Harry Panayotu. Um, I, I picked him not because I thought he was very good, but because I was incredibly <laughs> excited when the news first came out. And realistically, yeah. that's the best bit of a signing. That build-up of, like, oh, who's this? You know, he's, like, you know, exotic name from a far-flung land. Like, no one's ever heard of him. He's from Leicester, who I think had they, had they won the Premier League or they were certainly running about that time. They were on the right, they won it. Yeah, so, like, you know, there was that kind of excitement all round about it. So, um, scored one goal and missed one penalty and kind of close together against Rangers. Um, I think, yeah, obviously the excitement was kind of better than the signing. Um, but... Scored in the playoffs <laughs> against Tibbs as well in the first leg. Ah, you did actually, you're right, you're right. I hadn't, I hadn't for, I'd forgotten. And the goal that. against um, Rangers. You know, that one, that's the one I'm thinking about. Um, he now plays for a team in Gibraltar called Bruno's Magpies. Uh, when he plays at number 99, so it's good to see that he's not lost any of his uh, his wad of vivre about the football. And he also, he he also appeared, as a, he appeared as a groomsman on um, Married at First Sight this year. <laughs> it was one of the <laughs> wow. most random thing ever. Watching Married at First Sight, and I was like, that, that's Harry Paniotu. <laughs> it's like two worlds collide, man. Like, wow. Man. Actually... To go back a second to to like the kind of season that we're having, and you know you're top of the league and all this, you're you're signing like Kyle Turner in in uh, January. That is the trade off. Is you don't get cult heroes when you're good. Yeah. Like yeah. you're not you're not going to be top of the league and sign the different. Kev's good. <laughs> like, yeah, like, good like, cult see. heroes by cult hero is is a uh, is damning someone with faint. Um, praise like Absolutely. nobody's like oh this guy's just scored 15 goals in this in like half a season he's our cult hero he's just yeah. a hero the cult he's part of it hero. means pish yeah. I feel like Damien Castellanovo is our ultimate ever cult hero though like that guy just uh, he, uh, he was completely well, falls into that category made about 10 appearances for us scored about 4 goals or something and then he went off and retired to become an accountant and just really nice guy still still <laughs> Fondly remembered for the Derby goal uh, on his debut, just randomly coming up. But I, I do think that the thing, the thing about the top flight is that um, a lot of teams do sign these sort of just random players out of the blue, like Dundee signing lads from Mexico and stuff like that. Ah, like, I, I could that. get on board with that. Like, it's just I just the thing that. I like about that is they signed a really good guy from Mexico. And then just another guy from Mexico to keep going. <laughs> like, yeah. One guy is decent, and one guy who's just really sound. This is fine. Yeah, exactly. Um, right, Blair, uh, round us off for this one. Please. This is going to be short and sweet. I had about 15 lined up just in case, but I can't believe no. we got this far through this. No, you have all got it wrong. The answer Sam Stanton. Plain and simple. Sam Stanton, the single greatest January transfer we've had because he's now on a two and a half year deal and is the man. Love him. Yeah, best best January transfer we've ever had. Excellent. You know, it's the best answer there. Best answer for me. <laughs> my answer. I'm, I win. I'm the best. I win. Um, which, to be fair, what a, what a note to end on. Um, so, uh, as always, uh, a huge thank you uh, to everybody for, for listening and or uh, watching. 
And uh, also, just uh, this week, want to ex- extend a, a very special thank you to everybody who's bought something from the, the mm. merch shop Massively. in the last week or so. Um, it's a lot of hard work, chiefly from Blair, um, went into setting it all up. And I think we've all been uh, kind of delighted and a little bit <laughs> pleasantly surprised uh, yeah. with the response, to be fair. Um, if you haven't had a look at that already, the link will be in the kind of podcast description in the show notes. Uh, it's onononopodcast.etsy.com if you really feel like typing it all out. Um, so you can see what's on offer there. And uh, we will see you all again after the game on Saturday to talk about whatever has happened that uh, Christina has correctly predicted. <laughs>